All right, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm excited to introduce Manuel Ribeiro. Uh, Manuel is traveling here from EPFL all the way in Switzerland, so welcome to Seattle, uh, where he's a final year PhD student. Uh, Manuel has done some really societally relevant work, I would say, on the impact of content moderation, uh, monetization, recommender systems in online platforms using causal inference methods. Uh, many of his findings have had major impacts in industry, where he's also had a number of collaborations. Uh, Manuel has been recognized for his work, uh, including a Facebook Fellowship Award, Forbes 30 Under 30, Best Paper Honorable Mention Award at CCW, and probably a bunch of other things I, I don't have listed, but uh, looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. Do I have a mic? Yes? Okay, cool. Uh, okay. Hey, my name is Manuel, as Amy said, uh, and today I'm going to talk about online platforms like YouTube or Facebook or Tinder, you name it. These platforms are central to our lives, and the way that they moderate, recommend, or monetize content mediates the benefits and the harms of these platforms. And today, I'm going to talk about research that can improve online platforms, and hopefully, in doing so, also improve society at large. But before going there, I want to take a step back and propose we all imagine just what would happen if, out of the blue, all these platforms just disappeared. It would disrupt our economies, right? I mean, we all buy stuff on Amazon, and we watch movies on Netflix, and we order food on Uber Eats. Not to mention that would, it would dismember communities that mean a lot to a lot of people, right? Uh, we as researchers, many of us, wouldn't be able to keep up to date with the latest papers on Twitter or X or Mastodon or Blue Sky, and not to mention all the communities that uh, are formed around interests such as hiking or gardening or bouldering. And imagine how hard it would be to learn anything. Uh, Bayesian statistics or how to remove oil stains from clothes or who won the World Cup in 1994. All of that without YouTube or Wikipedia or Coursera it would be tricky, right? And in that context, it is not surprising that online platforms are also connected to some of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. Social media, for example, has played a crucial role in radicalizing individuals, um, like we showed, for example, in this 2019 paper, where we showed that um, people went on from consuming contrarian influencers on YouTube to uh, white supremacist content. And I guess we're all well aware that Social media is not the only concern here. And these platforms pose uh, threats to our mental health, to our information ecosystem, and so on. But online platforms are not immovable rocks that we should accept as they are. They are social technical systems that can be tweaked and adjusted. And as a society, I think it's fair to say that we want to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of these platforms. And throughout my doctorate, I advanced towards this goal through research that aims to understand the causal effect of content creation practices in online platforms. And there's two key concepts here, so let me unpack that. The first one is curation practices. And this is really an umbrella term for what platforms mostly do. They curate. Users on these platforms create tweets, they upload images, they make profiles, and platforms curate this content and serve it to other users also on the platform. And there's some important ways in which they do that. They choose what to recommend to users, they choose what content to keep and what content to remove, and they choose how to monetize content on the platform. And importantly, these are actionable. If we figure out how these levers, how, how these creation practices shape online platforms, we can actually improve them. Recommend assistance can be tweaked, moderation and monetization policies can be adjusted. And throughout my doctorate, my research on that has been published in CS uh, conferences and general interest journals in meaningful collaborations with industry and academia. But most important, has had real-world impact. Um, it has helped shape the public debate around this, appearing in over 100 news pieces from El País to NBC News, in reports by think tanks, and has shaped products in companies like Meta and Reddit. 
But let's get back to understanding the causal effect of content creation practices. Because there's a second key concept we need here, which is causality. You see, descriptive work delineates correlations. It describes how the world is like, which is very important, right? Because we've we got to understand what's going on in online platforms. This is what we did in that 2019 paper. We answered the question, what is going on on YouTube, right? Like, are users moving towards more radical content? But to truly change online platforms, we must be able to ask, what if? We must be able to imagine what would happen if we flip some switch. And for that, we need to go beyond merely describing online platforms. So for example, in more recent work that is just out at PNAS, we, we answered a question that goes into this what if direction. If users blindly follow the algorithm, will they randomly consume more radical content? And surprisingly, we found that the answer to this question is no, that uh, the algorithm seems to uh, moderate users' uh, consumption. But the, the key point here is that if we want to improve online platforms, we must be able to answer the second kind of question. We must be able to answer the what if kind of question. And okay, so now that I set my agenda, let me walk you through today's menu. Hopefully, the appetizer was tasty enough and I was able to convince you all that you should care about content creation in online platforms. And next, I'm gonna talk about two research projects around one of the main ways in which platforms curate content, which is content moderation. I'm gonna talk about moderating comments on Facebook and I'm gonna talk about the platforming. And then I'm gonna close things off with my vision for future work. But what I hope to get across, besides the projects themselves, is my research style. I like to tackle real world questions and that provide actionable insights with, with answering these questions. And I often accomplish that by collaborating broadly across industry and academia. And at the same time, I like to draw causal conclusions. But this is tough, right? Because oftentimes we don't have access to experiments. So I've often done so by finding natural experiments in large, messy observational data. So let me give a concrete example that puts everything I talked about in practice. One of the key problems online platforms face is the proliferation of mean, harmful content. This kind of content makes interacting with the platform like not as pleasant as it could be, but is also illegal in many countries. But the problem is that there's too much content and platforms often have to resort to automated means because they cannot simply parse through all the content that needs to be moderated. Uh, so for example, if you post something nasty on Facebook, you're likely to receive a screen like this, where your like, they will inform you that your comment has been deleted. And if you keep doing that, your account may be restricted and you, you can even be banned, right? And in 2021, I became a Meta or Facebook fellow and I went on to become an intern and a contractor there. And something that struck me is that they did not have a good answer to a very fundamental question. Do these automated moderation systems work? Do they make users behave better on the long run? And you know, if you think about it, you're meta. Why can't you just run a randomized controlled experiment about this? You could, every time that a harmful comment is posted, you could simply flip a coin and depending on where it lands, you would delete this comment or not. And then you could compare the outcomes of users for whom uh, you deleted the comment with the users for, for whom you did not delete the comment, right? And what I came to realize while well, during my time at Meta is that running such an experiment is actually very tricky. First, because um, you'd actually be abstaining from deleting harmful comments in the control group, which is questionable. But at the same time, even if it weren't, people hate being in this kind of experiment. So whenever it comes out that companies did research with this kind of experiment, there's big public outrage. So what should we do? Should we just give up? And I guess here it's obvious that we shouldn't because I wouldn't have spent five minutes of my talk talking about this. But more generally, you know, I think there's a good uh, reason for, for not giving up here. Most of the data in big data is this found data. It's not data that was collected for exper so some experimental purpose. So if we're able to figure out what to do with this kind of data, you know, we have plenty of data that's has already been collected by the world taking its messy course. So let's assume that a randomized experiment is not an option 
And let's see what would go wrong if we did a simple thing and if we looked at correlations. We could simply compare users that had their comments deleted with users that did not, right? And the spoiler here is that this would not work, right? Because here it's not clear if we would be measuring the effect of auto-deleting comments. Instead, it's likely that we would be measuring differences between these two very different kinds of users, right? The kind of user that gets their comments deleted is very different from the regular Facebook user. And here's the coolest part about doing this kind of work. It requires us to approximate an experiment with data that we have at hand. This is often difficult, it's not trivial, and it's very context specific. And it gives you this aha moment where, which I hope I can share with you today. So let's begin by looking at how Facebook actually decides how to delete su such comments. They do so with a classifier. Each comment gets scored on a scale from zero to one, uh, and there's some sort of threshold such that comments that are right above this threshold are deleted, and comments that are right below this, uh, below this threshold are not. And so far, we've gained nothing, right? This is just another way of looking at the invalid correlational uh, setup that I talked about before. But there's something neat here. If we focus around the threshold, we have that comments that get or that do not get deleted are very similar, right? If comments that received scores right below the threshold or right above the threshold are essentially the same with regards to harmfulness, but they receive very different treatment. Some of them get deleted, some of them don't. So as long as we focus around the threshold, we have something that's very close to a real experiment. We have a natural experiment for free. But now that we got the gist of it, there's a small lie in what I said before. And this lie is that this decision is made deterministically around the threshold. Unfortunately, that's not true. At a, comp at a complex company like Facebook, reality is a bit more fuzzy. So on this plot, I'm showing the score on the x-axis and the probability of deletion on the y-axis. And note that this, if this was deterministic, this would look like a step function. The probability of deletion would be zero up to the threshold and then one. But in reality, when we're before the threshold, there can be other mechanisms that can delete the comment. For example, there can be other classifiers. And also, to my surprise, as a contractor, when, I was, when you're after the threshold, um, there's, there's actually there are actually classifiers meant to fish out incorrect comments and prevent them from being deleted. But still, that there's, there's this big jump uh, around the threshold which um, really uh, can be exploited as a natural experiment still. And we can do that with a methodology called fuzzy regression discontinuity, which needs two ingredients. And the first one is what I've already shown you, which is this jump in the probability of treatment, which I'll write like this. The expected value of x, which here is this binary variable, uh, variable indicating deletion, right after minus right before the threshold. And the second thing we need is some sort of outcome. Let's say that day zero is the day when someone posts a comment that is near the threshold, and that we follow this user for a specific follow-up period, say 28 days. We can use this follow-up period to calculate an outcome we care about. For example, the number of subsequent deletions that this comment uh, receives. And, um, and this does not count the initial deletion, right? So this is after the person made this initial comment that might have been or might have not been deleted. And we can, I can show this, 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 uh, this outcome in a very similar plot, right? Where again, on the x-axis I have the score and on the y-axis I have the, the, the outcome. And here you can see that things are going kind of smoothly before the threshold and also after the threshold, but there's this big decrease right around the threshold, which is related to the causal effect, right? This is what's happening around the intervention. And this gap is the other thing I need for my fuzzy regression discontinuity. Um, I need how much the outcome changed around the threshold. And the big insight of this method is that if we divide these two quantities, we get a measure of the causal effect. Or specifically, we get a measure of the local average treatment effect at the cutoff, or LATEC, right? And it makes sense if you think about it. You're dividing the effect size by the percentage of users you treated, right? 
In practice, we can estimate that with a methodology called two-stage least-square regression, which consists of fitting these two linear models here. Um, one of them models the score as a function of the, uh, the, 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 the outcome as a function of the score. The other one, the treatment as a function of the score. Both models have some sort of baseline, some sort of trend, and they have this uh, coefficient associated with this dummy variable, which equals to one only after the threshold. When you fit this model, these variables will capture these gaps. If you divide these variables, you get the, est the estimate you want. There are some gory details here around how we estimate this in practice. But in short, we have a sound way of estimating the causal effect. And I use this study design to analyze almost half a billion Facebook comments posted between June and August 2022. Um, we focused around the violence and incitement classifier, which is one out of many used within Facebook, and considered two outcomes. First, the number of subsequent comments users had. And second, the number of subsequently deleted comments user had. Um, and we found very clearly that uh, once we looked at engagement, which is the number of subsequent comments, there's this initial decrease followed by uh, uh, this initial but transient decrease, right? So here on the y-axis, I'm showing the standardized effect. And on the x-axis, I'm showing different follow-up periods. And you can see that once we consider small follow-up periods, there's a significant effect. But once we consider longer follow-up periods, and these are cumulative, this effect disappears. At the same time, there is this persistent decrease in harmfulness, right, in the number of subsequent rule-breaking behavior. So even when I consider longer follow-up periods, when I look at harmfulness, I see that subsequent rule-breaking decreased which suggests that these systems are actually making users behave better on the long run. Um, in the paper, we also looked at um, another setup, which was this threat level setup. And there we found evidence of contagion, meaning that if you get your post deleted in someone's, your comment deleted in someone's post, it not only changes your subsequent behavior, but also others will, are, will be less likely to break the rules in, that, in, the, in the thread of that post where you deleted the comment. So in short, auto deletions work in the sense of work we, we discussed, right? And this paper is, in my opinion, a good example of how research on content creation practices can have potential, can, can, can impact uh, society, right? First, because we came up with this cool new way to, to, to measure uh, like the effect of content moderation, but most important because this has really changed how Facebook handles uh, deletions internally, right? Before, they used to think about this as exclusively a machine learning problem, right? Is my classifier, the, the, like what, what are the properties of my classifier? Is it high precision? And so on. But now, they also consider how it impacts uh, subsequent user behavior. And beyond deletions, in other projects, I have also studied uh, content creation practices, specifically, content creation practices around online communities. So for example, in other work with Facebook, we looked at a feature called post approvals, where moderators had to pre-approve um, each and every post before they land on a community's feed. And we found that this uh, feature, for instance, create groups that are centered around uh, fewer higher engagement posts. And more recently, I, I was fortunate to help design and, 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 and test in a large experiment, a new feature on Reddit called Post Guidance, where the idea is that um, you would get uh, feedback on submissions that you're trying to contribute to a community as you're writing them. So um, while you're trying to draft a post to, uh, I don't know, ask a question, if you're breaking any rules, you'd get some sort of warning saying, hey, your post is not, uh, is not uh, following community guidelines. And we found that in practice, this increases the success rate of posts, meaning that these posts, they live longer in the community. They do not get removed by moderators. And that they are perceived to be higher quality than posts uh, that are made without this feature. Uh, and we are currently extending this for, uh, in partnership with uh, Wikimedia Foundation to try to prevent a newcomer churn on Wikipedia. And you might say that these kind of interventions are small and that, you know, like maybe they're not uh, important, but I would argue that in aggregate, they, they, they shape our online spaces, right? So in aggregate, they're very important. 
But at the same time, you have other interventions which can single-handedly alter our information ecosystem, like banning influential figures from Twitter or from, from Facebook. And this is the flavor of the second project I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about the platforming. And um, the platforming is this umbrella term that really refers to banning something from online platforms. And there's a big complicated debate around whether and when it should be done, with proponents arguing that it can improve online spaces and opponents worrying about censorship and that the measure might be ineffective. And as a researcher, I think it's important to have some sort of informed debate that we clarify what really this, this intervention is doing in the first place. Does it work? What are the consequences of the platforming? And before going there, let me give you a crash course on the whole thing, on the platforming. And I'll use Parler as a case study here because this will be what we will look later on. So Parler was this social media platform that was particularly popular among Trump supporters in the 2020 election. So usually there is some sort of event, and in Parler's case, this event was January 6th. Uh, this event triggers uh, a lot of attention towards the deplatformed entity. In this case, Parler was uh, pivotal to January 6th, so there was a lot of attention towards the platform. And both these things lead to the deplatforming of the entity. And in this case, uh, Parler was banned from the app stores, but most important, from AWS, which hosted them. So the platform essentially vanished from thin air. And the big question here, again, is does Parler work? Does the platforming work? And by work here, I, I have a very specific meaning, which is when you ban one of those platforms, did this actually change anything? Did it change users' diets? You know, it could be that we just uh, we banned Parler and now everyone just moved to other similar platforms where they consume very similar kinds of content. And I would argue that this would, would mean that it did not work, right? That um, you're just substituting where you're getting your content from. And again, you could imagine, it's, it's a bit more absurd now, but you could imagine a randomized experiment here. Uh, every time there's some sort of rule breaking incident, let's assume that Amazon and AWS hosts everyone, and they could flip a coin and say, hey, do we ban them or not? And then we compare attention towards um, fringe platforms in general, and here I'm, I'm calling uh, these platforms fringe platforms in opposition to mainstream platforms like YouTube and Facebook, and we say, okay, like how did attention towards these platforms change in cases where I banned one of them versus in cases where I did not ban one of them? And here, I guess I don't need to do a lot of convincing that this is not feasible, and you could, be, you could only imagine how happy regulators would be uh, that this banning is done completely at random, right? So, but again, we should not give up, because these are important questions, and in this case, it's not that we uh, don't want to run an experiment, but really that we can't run an experiment. So, let's see if we can find some neat way to extract causality from observational data. And I'll, again, I'll start from what would happen if we did the simple thing, right? So we could do a simple pre versus post study here. We could simply measure attention towards uh, fringe platforms in general before and after the whole thing happened, before and after uh, the event, January 6th, and the banning of Parler happened. But the problem here is that it is not clear if we would be measuring the effect of the event or the effect of the platforming, right? It could be that the event had a strong positive increase in attention towards these platforms, and the platforming had a small negative increase, but that in aggregate, we would just get the wrong answer, right? So this won't cut it. And one of the ways that we can try to get around that is to really think about this attention as coming from different kinds of users, right? So here, I'm creating categories of users that will be helpful to me later on. So let's say that attention in general towards fringe platforms can be divided into three types. And I'll call the first type parlor users, attention from parlor users. And these are users who used fringe platforms before the event and the, the platforming happened, but that um, almost exclusively use parlor. Then we have what I'm calling fringe users, which are users that used fringe platforms, but that almost exclusively used other fringe platforms that are not Parler. And then we have a third category, which is other users, which is everyone else. 
And again, we gain nothing here, right? I'm just explaining one way that we can split the data and look at it differently. But there's something neat here. If we focus on the first two categories of users, we can actually approximate an experiment. For instance, imagine that we do this pre versus post uh, study only considering part of users, and we get this red delta. These users experience both the deplatforming and the event. And we can do the same thing for fringe users and get this orange delta. But importantly, these users only experience the event. They did not experience the deplatforming the same as other part of users, because the platforms that they used were not deplatformed, right? And as long as we assume that these things are additive, as long as we assume, uh, more precisely, that in the absence of the platforming, these two groups would have progressed similarly, which is what we call parallel trans assumption, we have that the difference between these two deltas, or in other words, the difference in differences between these two groups is the causal effect of the platforming. Identify those uh, those groups and so on. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, so basically, you identify these groups, um, and part of it will come later on. But you try to obtain similar users, and you 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 measure their their attention towards these kind of platforms prior to the whole thing happen, because otherwise you're conditioning on on the outcome, which which is bad, right? So you you would use data that you had from before the, the events to do that. But I'll, I'll, I'll get to the data right now, so let me know if you, I don't answer your question. Um, so as long as we focus on these kinds of users and that we have this clever uh, assumption, or at least convenient assumption, we can actually get to something that's very close to a real experiment here, a natural experiment again. And the big question here is even how do we capture attention, right? Like what is this attention I'm talking about? Uh, because, I mean, it's very common to talk about things like page views or daily active users if you are uh, Google or Meta or TikTok. But in academia, that's not so common. And to my great fortune, I came across Homa and Duncan, great collaborators who happen to have access to Nielsen data. Yes, the Nielsen, and I pronounced this wrong, I've, I realized uh, through my trip in the US that it's Nielsen data. Uh, and yes, Nielsen that does the TV tracking stuff. Um, he has gone into the business of tracking online behavior. And they have this huge panel of uh, paid users where for, for each user they have basically full web history and app usage and they have socioeconomic uh, characteristics, which is very nice. And this data has a lot of advantages over the type of traditional social media data that uh, we use. First, it is cross-platform, which is much needed for the study at hand because we really care about attention towards these different kinds of platforms, but second, uh, it allows us to track passive engagement, which is key because users that tweet or post are a very specific demographic. And here, we're really interested around this uh, engagement across different mediums where, you know, like um, where active engagement patterns might change. Uh, so we use this uh, data and this methodology to study the impact of banning parlor. And to do that, we actually selected a thousand panelists from that sample that I talked about before. And these are matched one-to-one -one, uh, according to socioeconomic characteristics. Half of this sample is composed of what I call parlor users. So these are users where um, they mostly consume parlor before the intervention, right? So they consumed uh, a specific amount of like enough print social media platform. So we set a threshold there of like 10 minutes per week. And um, after that, we enforce that most of this was parlor. And at the same time, we have fringe users, which are similar users, and they are matched one-to-one -one so that they have, for instance, the same demographics, the same social economic background, and so on, but they consumed other fringe social media. And our key outcome here was the daily active use of different kinds of websites. So of parlor, of free social, uh, other fringe social media platforms like Gab or 4chan and of free social media in general. And let me show one of these outcomes to you. So in this plot here on the y-axis, I'm showing the daily active uh, users for, the, for both the, the, the groups. 
uh, and for other free social media platforms, right? And here you can see that before, by design, before this is very low for parlor users, and there is this jump, right, right, right around the, the, the intervention. And with this data, we can basically calculate the pre-intervention period as the month of December, uh, the post-intervention period as when the, the period after Parlo was banned. Uh, we can calculate the deltas and we can estimate the causal effect, right? And this is done with a linear model. It's a bit more fancy than this, but that's the gist of it, right? So what did we find? Um, the first thing I can show basically relates to the plot that I had in the previous slide. And here I'm splitting the results between desktop and mobile users because for some of the, the panelists we had only desktop data, for some of the panelists we had only mobile data. And here we can see that banning parlor increased the consumption of other free social media platforms. At the same time, and perhaps not surprisingly, it decreased the consumption of parlor, right? Because the platform was gone. But what, what, what really matters is what happens in aggregate, right? What happens when we look at fringe consumption of free social media in general? And here we find that not much, right? It remained more or less the same. And this is for daily active use, but we find very similar results for another outcome, which is time spent, for whom we didn't have for both panels. But essentially, all the data suggests that even after banning parlor, people still use, consume this kind of content, more or less the same amount. So the platforming did not work, right? And although this is a negative finding, I still think it's a valuable, uh, important thing to do because we have a clear, sharp implication to that, right? The banning one of these fringe platforms is not effective in reducing the consumption of fringe platforms in general. So if this is the rationale that we say, okay, we're banning some platform because of that, that's not working, right? And we should not, um, we, we should try other things, right? Um, and besides that, I think that this methodology could be helpful to evaluate other the platforming events, right? Because as we talked about in the, in the beginning, the platforming is not this single intervention, but it's really this umbrella term that is used to talk about banning all sorts of things. Uh, and for example, in other work, I actually studied the effect of banning some of these other entities that are not platforms, but rather communities or influencers. And here, for instance, for communities, we found that when you ban a, a community from a mainstream platform, uh, they often migrate to this small community that is like self-hosted or that is in another fringe platform. Um, and, and, and this community loses a lot of their members, but members that remain become more toxic in this community that spawns from the original community. At the same time, when we looked at influencers, we found that banning influencers from mainstream platforms greatly reduces attention towards them, right? And this heterogeneity might seem a bit frustrating, but I would argue is exactly the reason why we need this kind of work. Because um, these are complex systems and intervening upon them is, is hard, right? Like we don't know exactly what's gonna happen and each case will be different. And I hope these two projects give a good sense of um, how we can study content creation practice in online platforms. But still, something that you might ask is why should I do this kind of work in academia? Why shouldn't I just go to industry? And um, there's a bunch of very clever people working in teams, often called trust and safety teams, and they work in topics that are very relevant, right? They work on content moderation and self-harm, and more, they have access to data and to experimenting infrastructure, so why not, right? And the answer here is that these companies by themselves have not been able to tackle the challenges that we have. And uh, this is because their incentives are poorly aligned in big ways sometimes, but also in subtle ways, right? Where promotions or bonuses or, uh, you know, like the, the way these companies work do, does not prioritize this kind of work or does not uh, provide long-term incentives that infrastructure to study this in a systematic way is built. But also that these companies often lack some systemic view around uh, the ecosystem of online platforms, right? For example, in this part of work, we really needed to look at a bunch of different platforms. And within companies, they mostly care about their own product, right? So I would argue that we also need to do this kind of work in academia. And here, the issues are a bit flipped. We, we have better aligned incentives and we're better positioned to have a systemic view, but we lack access to data and to experiments. And 
trying to improve this situation is part of my future research agenda. I want to help build infrastructure to study online platforms, especially now where um, APIs are scarce and hard to come by. Um, I want to find new ways to obtain data. Can we, for instance, recruit online panels like the ones I used? Can we develop browser extensions or data sharing schemes where we ask users to donate their data? I've been experimenting with some of these uh, with, in collaboration with a Swiss NGO called Turnisol that provides open source software to tweak YouTube recommendations. And, but overall, I think this is a very interesting overall direction. Um, at the same time, we, can, we, we need to find ways of drawing conclusions from the data that we have at hand. And for that, it's very important that um, we develop and find ways to apply causal inference to the data that we have. We are in the wake of this causal revolution and there's so much to be done, right? So for example, could we expand that design that I talked about on the Facebook scenario for the case when we do not know the threshold or we do not know the score that comments receive? Could we train our own classifier just by looking at the decisions that company takes and use the, the scores that our classifier yields to predict what's gonna happen and to use this score to do the causal inference? And last, I think that there's still a lot of value in collaborating with industry, right? And I hope that there's, there, there are new ways also to collaborate with industry. Uh, Europe is being shaken by the Digital Services Act and there's a lot of infrastructure that's being set to share data with researchers. And I hope this sparks a new era for collaborations between industry and academia. Um, another broad direction I'm very interested in is uh, around uh, artificial intelligence, right? And um, as large language models and generative AI becomes more powerful and more popular, this will bring enormous challenges to online platforms, but may also create new ways to study online platforms or to inter create new interventions in online platforms. So, for example, uh, right now when your comment gets deleted on Facebook, you get this boring uh, text, right? But what if they could explain uh, why your comment was deleted or have some sort of personalized text that could tell you uh, what you should do or what you should not do. This is well within the reach of current large language models. Um, at the same time, I see potential in uh, changing the way that we study um, online platforms in general, um, as well as the way we study human behavior, right? Because now uh, you can actually try to do simulations with large language models, and you could simulate experiments, for example. Uh, you could prompt uh, GPT giving some sort of tweet and ask like, do you, what do you do with that? Do you like it? Do you don't like it? You are this kind of demographic. And there are some surprising results that, have, uh, that, that are very promising right now, although there's a lot of shortcomings to, to be uh, circumvented still. Uh, one particular area I'm very interested about using silicon samples is to improve uh, algorithmic auditing. So, uh, for example, right now we do these deterministic algorithmic audits, like that PNAS paper that I talked about. So let me briefly explain that so that I can tell how I think that LLMs can improve algorithmic auditing. So there, we basically came up with this notion of counterfactual bots. So imagine that you have someone's YouTube history, the idea of, of the way that we audited YouTube there is that we create this control bot, which basically go through this YouTube history and watch videos in, in this YouTube history the same way that I did in this case, because this is my history. And then we collect some sort of outcome that we care about. For example, the recommendations that YouTube gives me. And at the same time, we create a, for a, a, another type of bot, which is this counterfactual bot where they, again, follow the, the YouTube history up to a certain point, but at some, at some moment they go rogue, right? And they start following some other deterministic algorithm. For example, they just consume the watch next video and they just consume what's instantly recommended to them by YouTube. And the, the, the idea of the paper is basically that if we compare the, the, what, what, what the counterfactual bot gets recommended with what the control bot gets recommended, we actually have a way of disentangling what is the effect of blindly following the algorithm, right? But why am I talking about this in future work? Because I see that there's a lot of potential here to generate these traces which are actually very expensive and very hard to come across with silicon samples, right? 
This could help democratize and expand audits. You could also help us audit populations that perhaps are very difficult to reach, right? There's huge concern around, for instance, the impact of social, of, of social media on teenagers and on kids, but it's so hard to actually get data for, for these kind of populations. So what if we can convincingly um, simulate the behavior of kids or teenagers? Or what if we can um, test interventions that would not be ethical or feasible in human subjects, right? There's a lot of concern around radicalization, but can we actually study that with, 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 with uh, these kind of samples? But I don't think it's only exciting directions that are enabled by, um, I mean, they are exciting as well. There's not like only these fun research directions where we can find new ways to study online platforms that, that, will, come, that, that will be caused by LLMs. LLMs are also like a reason for concern when it comes to online platforms. So in this, in this uh, survey by the World Economic Forum, for instance, AI generated misinformation and disinformation has been cited as the second biggest concern. And I think that there is huge value in actually assessing how realistic these concerns are. You know, can LLMs actually persuade humans any better than other humans? Uh, can images created by these models fool people? I think that we need to ground this, this kind of concern in like real data, in like empirical studies about it, so that we can l intervene in, in, in ways that are truly appropriate. Uh, let me talk about the first dip I did around this area, which is perhaps in, the, in, in an area that's not perhaps the, the first thing you would think about, which is crowdsourcing, like platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific. So um, we, in, in, a, in this paper with colleagues from Microsoft Research and from Prolific, uh, we found that around 30% of workers use uh, ChatGPT in a simple text summarization task, which is a huge problem, right? Because there's a bunch of psychologists using these platforms to study human behavior. And I'm excited about like silicon samples, but not that fast, right? Like what if now like a substantial chunk of psychology research is actually copying outputs from ChatGPT? Um, and one thing this work showed me is that like, I mean, researchers are also very scared of AI, right? Like this gets huge, this got huge attention from Twitter, from psychologists, from from social and traditional media. And I think this reflects the fact that we're all a bit concerned about how these new technologies will impact existing infrastructure. But there's so much more here, right? How will this change social media now that people can instantly swipe away people from the background or create new filters? How will it change reviewing, right? Now that ChatGPT can write something that resembles a peer review or online marketplaces uh, where it's already extremely hard to detect spam. If the review doesn't start with as an AI language model, you know, it's gonna be very hard to detect those. And um, the fundamental thing here is that generative AI has changed the rules of the game because it has enabled users to f create content that often looks and often is high quality, which wasn't possible before. And we must understand what harms do these new capabilities create and how can we mitigate these harms? So I hope you enjoyed today's menu. And if there's anything that's too hard to chew, here you can find it packed for the takeaway. My research can improve uh, online platforms by understanding content creation practices using causal inference, machine learning, network analysis. Uh, all this work has only been possible due to my amazing past and current collaborators. Thank you very much. All right, we have some time for questions. All right. Hi. So I, uh, going back to the slide where you talked about collecting data because we don't have enough data. Yes. So there you said that you maybe want to design an API for collecting data. So now there are so many regulations around like how to collect data, maybe data minimization and other principles. How do you see, like, what, what is your vision for, for these sort of tasks, and how do you want to bring in, like, legal perspectives and ethical decisions for, for specifically for data collection? Yeah, that's a good point. First, one of, the, one of the points here is that I think that this is really a collective, it should be a collective effort to collect this data because um, it's really tricky to um, do this, like, if, like it's something that requires a lot of effort and where 
the, the effort can actually be applied to others. So I think that this should be essentially collaborative uh, efforts. But on the other hand, you know, I would say that uh, we, should, we should have a clear, dis we should really assess the harm in, in the collection of specific data, right? And um, right now, the Supreme Court has ruled favorably around a lot of, um, around, around scraping, for example, right? Which is something that uh, perhaps is not super well aligned with data minimization. And I think as researchers, we have to do this balancing act to really think about, for specific projects, like what are the potential harms versus what are the potential benefits for that project? And I think that there's no shortcut around that, right? Like it's really something that needs to be done on a project level basis. Um, with, but but I, I, would, I would push back in some sense, in the sense that I think you can be overly cautious with this kind of, uh, of, of, of work, as I feel that, for instance, a lot of the legislation on, in Europe has been, you know. So I, have, I had colleagues, for example, that um, got uh, messages from the IRB saying like, did these politicians consent from, for you collecting these tweets or something like this, which is, which is absurd, right? So I think that uh, it, it, it really depends. And, um, and, and of course, right, like, I think that this broadly applies, like scraping and this kind of work, broadly applies to data that is meant to be public in the first place, right? Data that is public, for example, posted in a, in a, in a social media platform in broadcasting format, right? But, but it's, I, don't, I don't see a way around it other than like carefully considering the data at hand, to be very honest. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a fun talk, thank you. Um, so I had a question kind of a lot about the, I think the first project. Yeah. There's kind of two types of behavior change that you might see in people after an intervention. One would be that their, their actual behavior changes, and the other is that they start being evasive, right? They start trying to evade the classifier. Are you able to see whether or not the users are changing the behavior and that they're actually being less toxic or that they've identified how to be toxic and evade the classifier? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a very common concern around this type of discontinuity design. The way we address this in the paper is by really, is, is, we assume that if users know how to cheat, that the distribution of posts around the threshold would not be smooth. Okay, so if user, if you're able to somehow cheat and you know that the line is here and that you want to do something that's harmful, but you, you, you want to be just right before the line. So when you look at the distribution, you would see this little bump right before the line of the, 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 the threshold, right? So by checking this, you have some sort of sanity check that, okay, there's not, no systematical sorting around that. So on, on the other side, like one thing that we, we did in the paper that I didn't talk about here is that we had um, different analysis for what we called repeat offenders, right? So in this case, this was like the first time someone broke the rule. But you also have some sort of like penalty system inside of Facebook. And this intervention is actually less effective once you already have broken the rules. Which to me makes perfect sense, right? Like if you broke the rules once and you got the warning and you broke the rules again, it's likely that you don't care, right? So um, in, in some sense, I think that when we think about this content moderation interventions, it's helpful to have these different users in mind, users that are genuinely having a bad day or like, you know, like lost their track and could be, you know, like educated and users that really are like, would, would, would be very, very adversarial and that would go the extra mile to, you know, like circumvent whatever happens. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. So presumably when Facebook is setting that threshold, they're not setting it arbitrarily, they have some particular reason why they put it in the spot that they did versus elsewhere. Can you talk a little bit about how you uh, decide the ranges around kind of the threshold that you're selecting from? Yeah, so this is something I thought was more structured than it actually was. So, but um, essentially it has to do, like the original way they set the threshold has to do with the precision and the recall of the classifier. So that's the original motivation. But what I found in practice is that um, there's some kind of like wiggling around the threshold, which is done completely arbitrarily from like this feeling that things are getting worse or better or in reaction to real world events. So for example, there's some sort of like big conflict, they bump up the threshold a bit. And in part, the reason why we chose this like period 
and this classifier was actually because this was like a stable period and a stable classifier for which we had the same threshold at all times because this actually creates some problems. Um, like you, you get slightly less sharp estimate if you keep changing the threshold. And because then like you, you, you estimate the, the LaTeX, the, the, the causal estimate, but you, you get this average estimate over two different cutoffs, which is less sharp, you know? So we really tried to go for a classifier where there was this like long span of time where no one changed the threshold because of that. Uh, and I know that after that they did some experimenting with like try to slightly wiggle the threshold and see if there's significant changes in changes in user behavior, which is like I think a cool application of the, the, the threshold tweaking that you were, were mentioning. So I, I guess I, I'm gonna try to get in two questions at once. So the first one is um, these evaluations, you know, you're talking about them with respect to a particular threshold, but also the meaning of content changes over time. So for example, one of the things that groups started to do was to start with certain memes that people in the know would, would, would be abusive memes, but were not obviously abusive originally. So that's the, that's the first one. And the, the second one is sort of the related, a little bit related to that is there's a very different setup when you're talking about like extreme, extremism, fringe behavior in the public sphere versus like the trolling of teenagers by, by peers and so on and, and how much is there sort of cross between those? So sorry to try to put Yeah, in no, no, that's fine. So for the first question, um, that's absolutely true. I think for, for English, Facebook actually does a pretty good job because they have this some sort of like automated system where things get constantly fed up into the classifier. Um, so that is nice. Um, but for, for other languages, I think it's actually a big problem, you know, that like the, uh, there's a very slow response into these automated systems catching up with the new trend. Um, so it is definitely a problem, I think. And it's, uh, I think it, it creates this very kind of like the need to update these classifiers constantly to some extent. Um, and for the second question, I feel that, um, yes, these are like essentially different problems and they might require very different solutions, right? And I, I would say that in, in, the, in, 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 in that sense, I would say that the, the teenager issue or like the bullying, perhaps it, it's easier to solve than like radicalization and these kind of other issues, you know? So one thing that we, we found, for example, uh, one thing I find interesting if we look at the aggregate results around the platforming is that usually banning something from mainstream media actually reduces attention. And this is because you have some sort of incidental attention, which is akin to what you're saying of like some sort of incidental rule breaking. Um, but at the same time, when you ban something that's already hard to come by, it really like doesn't seem to work very much. And intuitively to me, this seems that this comes from the fact that these people are already going the extra mile to consume this kind of content. So it's only natural that they would continue to go the extra mile to consume this kind of content. So I think that this initial burden like really matters, you know, and that uh, it's really like, I don't think that there's a one size fits all approach to this kind of uh, problem. Yeah, this is, this is really interesting and actually relates to a question that I had, which is I'm very interested in kind of the difference between the behavior around the threshold and then the behavior far from the threshold. Because sometimes the way that I think about this more from a computer security terminology perspective is that kind of like the threat model of the people that you're thinking about is there are the people who are trying to be good, conscientious users of social media and maybe they got angry and so a nudge will work for them. And then there are the people who are like the adversaries. Um, yeah. I, I'm also interested in related to that kind of interventions that will backfire, like when people get upset that these platforms are censoring things or a different example, I recently learned about some work um, showing that people, when they are nudged to think about other people's privacy when sharing a photo, might be actually more likely than to report that they would share the photo, kind of bat the, the mm -hmm. nudge backfiring. So um, I guess I'm asking you about a few slightly different things, but I'm curious about your thoughts on these different populations and the behaviors more at the extremes. Yeah, uh, so on the, first, on the first comment, I think that um, the, this is a fundamental limitation of this research design. Because because you're exploiting like this, this jump, you really measure the causal effect at the threshold. 
And there's like an optimistic view about this and a pessimistic view about this. The pessimistic is that you don't get to observe this extreme. The optimistic is that this is the threshold that Facebook uses. So it's the most important place you would want to know because this is what's going on. Another thing I found remarkable there is that usually the distribution of comments decreases quite a lot. So, and it's like, so the, the further away you steer from the threshold, it usually is the case that you have fewer and fewer data. So there's this interesting phenomena that happens when you have this kind of distribution that no matter where you move the threshold, most of the data is close to the threshold. You know, because if you're if if you have this like highly skewed distribution and you have this threshold, close like al almost all the comments that get deleted are close to the threshold, because the data is so skewed towards like lower scores, right? Which I also find that it's it's useful in that sense, but yes, and like but but I don't I don't have a good answer, and I think it's actually very interesting. Um, one way that they could do, but, but it's very hard to do this without an experiment, I feel. Because really, you don't have common support here to do any causal inference, because these comments are deleted, so you never know, like, they, they're, they're by definition not there, right? So you wouldn't know, like, what's the effect on them. And on, on the backfiring side, I think that, um, yeah, and, and in general, you know, like, I think that it's, it's a big concern. And I think that in terms of, like, this, behavior at the edges, right, it's even worse because it's so hard to study these, right? I had, like, to, 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 to get to this parlor study, I had to have this, like, largest online panel I know of, you know? You look at this regular size online panels, it's just impossible to study that. And if I want to study 4chan of one of these weirder social medias, even this panel won't do because these are such a weird population that they do not appear there, you know? So it's really, like, it's really hard like to, to combine both the rigor of some of these approaches and the, the fact that this is such a hard problem to study, in my experience, which is probably your experience as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much to our speaker, and thank, thank you all you. for coming.